I would say ethical porn is inherently feminist, and a lot of a lot of ethical porn production companies are run by women. A, ma- a large majority of them are. And what I mean by inherently feminist is that instead of this, when we're talking about seeing female pleasure, I feel like ethical porn does a good I, a good job of portraying what female pleasure actually looks like, as opposed to this exaggerated fake orgasm so the male can feel satisfied like version of traditional porn i feel like ethical porn does a really good job of showing what sex actually it's more realistic is what i'm trying to say all right thank you for tuning in to sex positivity unfilter my name is Lindsay murray and i'm denise stratton And our episode today is a really interesting one about ethical porn versus traditional porn. And we're hoping to answer the question, is porn actually bad for you? Probably a more complex answer (laughs) than it is a question. And real quick before we dive in, there is a statistic I wanted to share. uh, And it's just that 80% of men and 32% of women report using porn on a regular basis. And so, you know, if if anyone is wondering, why would I care about different kinds of porn is it ethical is it moral it's because a lot of us are watching it whether we want to admit it or not and rather than shy away from it or pretend that we're not watching it or that we shouldn't be watching it the yep. reality is we're watching it very yes. regularly it's a huge industry and it's something we don't talk about or mention or anything no. and yet most of us do yeah exactly so there's a way to do it that isn't going to create harm to the people involved in porn to your relationships and so don't shy away from it. If you like porn, you know, li- listen up because we're going to talk about ways that you can do it morally and ethically in a way that you can feel good about yourself if yeah. you enjoy watching. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a lot of people use it. Um, the things that I was seeing, and again, I got a lot of this from a video as far as the statistics uh, by Dr. Rena Malik. So thank you. You know, shout out uh, Dr. Malik. You helped me a lot. But um, what she said as far as the reasons for use are they increase the desire. Um, it satisfies your curiosity. Mm-hmm. And the thing that's kind of a little sad, which was a little bit, is this is the way that a lot of people learn about anatomy and sex. Yeah, yeah and it's not usually going to be accurate. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and there's a... Um, which I'll get into later, but it's like just kind of making this known now. Porn is for adult entertainment. So when kids are watching it, that's all in and of itself a problem. And I, and I have a lot that I want to say about that later in the episode. But what, but what you just made me think of was like learning anatomy, or that being your form of sex education, is really sad because that's not what – sex really looks like in real life and especially if you're a kid but even if you're an adult you don't realize like all the production that goes into it and it can really kind of skew your perception of what sex is supposed to be Oh, and yeah, make no. real life pretty disappointing if that's where you're getting your education from, right? Yeah, it's very similar to, you know, um, I guess the video games where you, you have you have basically a what you're consuming all day and it doesn't reflect the real world. Like it's a, a skewed yeah reality uh, it's a, expectations are skewed exactly it's yeah. de- it's definitely skewed a lot and it's just not accurate you know it's not the best form of education and i and i i want to talk about like what ethical porn actually is versus what traditional porn is the i'm going to give you my definition of traditional porn now this is coming from a straight woman so okay. my if I were to go on Pornhub, the stuff that would pop up for me is probably pretty heteronormative. So I actually, as I as I explain this, I actually have a question for you, Denise, on like what traditional would mean to you as a lesbian. Because I'm sure, like, I don't know how an algorithm would work on Pornhub, but like for me, traditional porn is for the male gaze. Yes. And it's focused on blowjobs and intercourse a uh, majority of the time okay. yeah. <laughs> and even if the woman is like let's say there's like oral sex on a woman I feel like the focus is still still on male pleasure like what they're what they're getting out of it and in traditional porn the woman's pleasure is usually very exaggerated yes it's very exaggerated it's like talk about faking it <laughs> like yeah. holy shit there, I just you know when you watch it you're just like there's no way that it that it feels that great right it's all I really when I say male gaze the way I think about it and the whole point of it is like the male in the video gets a lot of excitement out of like 
making the woman come that many times or whatever. So it still leaves back to be for the man. Okay. So that's kind of what I think when I think of traditional porn. Um, And traditional porn, too, is the porn that's been around for a long time. And it very easily can be exploitive. It can be aggressive towards women. Yes. Um, and oh, there's yeah. <laughs> not and there's not always guaranteed consent. There can be a lot of coercion. There can be the actors not getting paid. Right. Oh, um, mm-hmm. Some traditional porn too is not having a focus on physical safety and health and not taking the precautions to make sure that. You're not getting an STD and it's just, I, I guess there's like a lot of carelessness in it and it's such a big industry. Oh, that, huge, huge industry. Huge industry. And it's easy to get, and especially, I, I'm going back to the aggression against women. A lot of porn is very aggressive yeah. towards women. And when they get into the industry, they're kind of thrown in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're thrown in there. And, Especially the amateur industry, yes. Yeah, and they're guaranteed they're going to make all this money and then it doesn't happen. So there's just a lot of, like, I don't know, ickiness wrapped in it when I think of traditional porn. So that's why I mentioned me being a straight woman. Like, when I think of traditional porn, it's very heteronormative. And so I don't know. Like, what, like, is that kind of how you would view Oh, very I guess, much. Yeah, no, porn? there's, okay. as a queer woman, I, very rarely if at all ever come across actual queer um porn Mm -hmm. and then or even porn that's like we don't even have to go queer that's tailored towards women right and women's pleasure that's very very rare so i'm curious actually are you part of that 30 percent that watches consumes porn uh, as far as women 30 percent of women yeah i am yeah i am yeah i do i enjoy it i think it's nice to watch oh, yeah, and it can, good. yeah, you feel good. It's a way, sometimes it can get me in the mood. Sometimes it can heighten the mood I'm already in. Mm. Um, and I think porn is something you can watch with a partner if you want to, you know, it can be like a shared experience. If you want to, it doesn't have to be, but if you're watching it just for adult entertainment, for erotic purposes, as a way to enhance arousal, I mean, I think there's a lot of good in it. Oh, right. good. No, I'm glad as a sex therapist you actually brought mm-hmm. that up because I came across that uh, couples who watch porn together, um, it, they find that they are more dedicated uh, to their partner and also are more sexually satisfied. So mm-hmm. it kind of brings people together. Although, again, not all as far as couples go, not everyone has the same um, likes and uh, dislikes. Preferences so. are exactly. different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, and maybe that's what it's like couples who watch porn together – are more satisfied, maybe more open. Because sometimes, and I, and I have couples that have that have expressed this to me, there may be you know some type of porn that they're not really in, but they know their partner is really into. And if your relationship is strong enough and you really feel like you're there for each other, sometimes it's okay to go along and watch a video that maybe isn't for you, but it's more for your partner. But you can get turned on by watching them get turned on. You know what I mean? Like, even if that's not your preference, I feel like there's a way you, if you wanted to, there's a way you could do it where it's like, not every video has to be for me and it can be for my partner and there can still be some kind of arousal in there for me. If oh, that I like makes that. sense. Yeah. I mm-hmm. like that. That's, that's a really good way. Cause I honestly, in me and my group of friends and everything, I can't ever, A, we don't talk about the porn we watch ever Uh (laughs) which is just something yeah you just don't talk about (laughs) and b i can't see um yeah i couldn't see as couples uh, any of them watching together so that's actually i like hearing that it can be um um, a bonding experience almost or it can bring you it can bring you more information on your partner which is also really nice exactly it can definitely be a bonding experience a way to bring you closer so there's a lot of nice things within that too in your relationship and when we're talking about porn I know said earlier we're going to answer the question is is porn actually bad for you my opinion is no but it can be right okay. with <laughs> just, any, kinda, just like anything just with anything else it can be bad okay. but what i do want to say about that is there's this bad side of it where if someone is in the porn industry and they've been really harmed by the industry, obviously that's bad. Of and course. that's not what we want. And we're and, and when we dive into like more what ethical porn really means, there's a lot to be said about how do you how do you reduce harm, right? You can in the industry. But a lot of times it doesn't happen. People walk walk away abused, harassed, you know, not making any money, feeling like they have to push the limits, there's all this stuff, right? So there's that part that's like quote unquote bad. But like as a viewer, is porn bad? 
the research shows that it's not so much that like porn is so bad and you're watching too much of it. It's your relationship to porn that can create the stress. Yes. If if you grew up, a, let's I'm going to use religion as an example. Porn okay. is not allowed at all, but you enjoy it. Every time you watch it, you might get enjoyment because it's something you like watching. But then you have immediate shame because you shouldn't be doing it. But then what are you doing to cope with that shame? You're watching more porn because that's what you really enjoy. <laughs> like people use it as a way to cope with these negative emotions. Interesting. And then the way you cope with it is not allowed. So then you have more shame and then you use porn to cope. And then it's like this never cycle. ending. It's this shame cycle wrapped around porn. And so if you're looking at the research, you know, it's going to show you it's not that porn is going to have this like watching it's going to have this horrible impact on your life it's your relationship to it and people in the lgbtq community are more likely to get diagnosed with porn addiction which side note is not a real diagnosis but they're they're more likely to get labeled that way because the kind of porn that's going to represent the sex that they like is not really in the mainstream like even now it's not nearly as popular let's say at as all. seeing straight couples you know be intimate on the screen well okay let me mm -hmm. have a really quick correction so mm -hmm. yeah when i say queer porn is not popular what i am what we might get a little clap back on the fact that lesbian porn's everywhere like you can find but i feel like it's still for the male gaze exactly it's still for it's just like it always gets looped around back to like watching two women fuck is so hot for me as a man <laughs> and it's like again which is so funny because watching two women fuck for the male gaze is actually not attractive to me and i am a lesbian that should technically be my representation in the uh, industry is the lesbian porn but I find myself, and I also find a lot of my queer friends, my queer women friends, we don't watch lesbian porn because of that reason. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't know. And it makes total sense, though, because it's not for you. No. And you can tell by the way it's produced. It's not for me. Yeah, they have long, fi they have fingernails the size yeah. of Lindsay's. <laughs> <laughs> they have that. Their hair is not up. It's in their face. Like, they're, it's just every, whenever I see those scenes, as much as I do know, um, doing the research as far as um, what the porn uh, stars, or sex workers, what the sex workers, they actually enjoy doing the women versus women scenes, most of them, because yeah. um, there's not that, um, uh, there's there's not a power imbalance. Women are safer. Yeah, exactly. They there are, yeah. Um, so, I mean, that aspect is nice, but because it's tailored towards men and their desires and for them to be able to get off, it's just not realistic. So it takes me out of the moment when I see lesbian porn because I'm just like, that's not real. And then, yeah, scissoring. It, that's not normal. That's not what we, that's not how our sex actually looks typically. Yeah. So it just, yeah, makes it way more fake than it could be. Yeah. So you know it's not for you, yes, right? Exactly. And so then when you're like, the and I'm going back to this research. It's this research that was done in the Netherlands, and I have I do have the source for it. But when I'm going back to the research that I'm talking about, um, people in the LGBTQ community are more likely to get labeled with porn addiction because the porn that is for them, they have to hide it. Like yes. they don't want anyone to know they're looking at it. And a lot of them may not be out, so they're really keeping their sexuality to themselves. And it goes back to that loop, right? Like you finally find what you enjoy, but there's a lot of shame in it because you shouldn't be liking it that should not be your sexuality and so but i like watching what i like so that's how i'm going to cope with the shame that i feel and then again you know it's like never ending and i was mentioning the internalized homophobia earlier mm -hmm. if someone is quote unquote straight but they're really not straight like everyone ev they present as straight but really they like the same sex or whatever they're closeted yes they're closeted yeah and so they're really keeping you know all this stuff like they're not having the sex that they want to have in real life because they're not out. So they're going to be, they're watching more porn to kind of like get that satisfaction. And so if they go to a professional and the professional says like, you watch too much porn. It always blows my mind. Cause I'm like, I don't think the porn is the issue. I think the issue is the shame. Hey, I like that, mm -hmm. man. That just brought me back to my teenage years. A little mm -hmm. bit of a, um, because for me, like I said, I would, I was, oh shit. My first, mm. All right, so this is a good question for you that I'm also going to answer as well. Mm -hmm. When did you start watching porn? How old were you? 
I was probably, you know, I was in college, I think. I was, oh, I was wow. older. Yeah, Good. I was older. Like, I, I think, I think most people's experience is teen years, sometimes even younger yeah, than that. Th- that was me. Yeah, I think I was older. Yeah. I, I was very sheltered, I feel like. Good. Well, yeah. <laughs> Good in a way, good. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, no, I stumbled upon my first uh, porn movie, A, for you older people out there who are in your 30s and older. Pay-per-view, porn used to be on pay-per-view, right? Mm -hmm. And I had a uncle who lived with us. And so after midnight, he basically, he took care of the cable bill, so he would rent these uh, videos. And way back when, you older people are going to understand, if you rented a porn porn if you rented a pay-per-view movie it showed on every tv of the house that mm-hmm. was just how it was yeah like you you if someone wants to rent it was all you know, connected Marvel, yeah i yep. was about to say everybody's watching yeah. that movie right so um i remember t- turning on the tv or i think i had the tv playing and then just automatically changed to up i guess he just didn't realize that i was up so i got yeah. to see it uh early um and then when I was a teenager and I was feeling these homophobic feelings and I was I was closeted when I was in my teenagers. Mm-hmm. I didn't come out until I was an adult. Um, because of that, porn was the only place that I really could go to. Um, however, I could never find anything that tailored towards my queer identity and what I wanted to see. So I would sneak around and watch back then was a show called the l word oh yes i know the l word yes Mm -hmm. yes very popular show has very uh good girl on girl sex scenes and that would be my version of porn that's how i would i would see these scenes and i would feel those feelings and that's kind of what i used i I mean it's not it's not a porn show but they had those scenes so that's what i that's that's what it went that's where it went yeah this actually reminds me so I was older when I started watching porn but I remember being a teenager I don't remember how old maybe 14 15 like around that age but there's a movie I believe the title of the movie is called Unfaithful have you ever heard of it oh that was also one of my yes okay yeah, yeah. yes 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 <laughs> I, I watched Unfaithful and it was really late at night and my parents were asleep and so I got to watch it on the tv in the living room and that is a hot movie. That, it was a hot scene. I know Spicy, exactly what scene you're yeah, talking Spicy, yeah. I was about. like, "Ooh, Lord!" And you know, the guy's like really hot. And, and um, oh, what's the what's the woman's name? Is it Jodie Foster? If it's I not Jodie Foster. Damn it. Um, Diane Lane. Di- I, think. I think. So. I think it's Diane Lane. I think, so. I think so. But you know, she was really hot too. And it just, I mean, they knew what they were doing. And so, but I remember. So I watched it. And I guess back back then you could like see what you had watched before. Like if my mom went on the t- I mean it might have been like a recording or something. Oh shit. And so my mom could go and say what was played. And so she questioned me about it, grilled me about it, and I'm assuming she knows what the movie is about, which is why she was so <laughs> upset about it. Did you watch this movie? And I had to lie and say no. I was like, no, no, I was asleep. Like I just, I it must have just kept going playing mm. as I fell asleep on the couch. Uh, no, I didn't see any of it because the way she was grilling me, I could tell she was like kind of pissed about of course, yeah. about it. Um, and I did, yeah. I was like, no, 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 I didn't. I totally fucking lied about it. Um, I've seen that movie a few times <laughs> since then. You know, <laughs> I understand. I understand. I would rewind and I would replay those scenes. And I remember when DVR came out. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that was my version because, of course, I was too young to even be on those sites, so I never mm-hmm. went on those sites. Um, but yeah, that, that I'd say teenagers still get. They, they figure ways around it. Well, because teenagers are curious. They do. They are hormonal. They experience mm. physical arousal. They think about sex. They think the, the other, you know, their peers, if they're attracted to them, they're imagining having sex with them. All of that, I think, is a very normal part of your sexual development. And if we can normalize that and have proper education around it, like I know we've talked about before, but if we can normalize that and have proper education around it, their sexual development will continue to develop in a healthy way as opposed to this fear-based, shame-based, it's too taboo, we're not going to talk about it, you shouldn't even be doing it, you shouldn't even be thinking about it, like suppress, 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 right? When that's when that's the route, what are you going to turn to? Videos that you can watch in private, yeah. that you can watch on your own, and that's really when you know, the problem's kind of start but we have not answered what ethical porn is yet oh, so yeah, yeah. yeah i just not thought i just not thought about that 
I'll share my definition, and then I want, and then of course, if you have anything to add or anything you found, it, when when you look at ethical porn, there's not just one definition. No, <laughs> there's a whole lot that goes into how do you define that. I would say ethical porn is inherently feminist, and a lot of a lot of ethical porn production companies are run by women. A, major, a large majority of them are, and what I mean by inherently feminist is that instead of this, when we're talking about seeing female pleasure, I feel like ethical porn does a good I, a good job of portraying what female pleasure actually looks like as opposed to this exaggerated fake orgasm so the male can f- feel satisfied Agreed. like version of traditional yes. porn. I feel like ethical porn does a really good job of showing what sex actually, it's more realistic is what I'm trying to say. It's more realistic. It's not just focused on blowjobs and intercourse. It's focused on female pleasure in addition to male pleasure. And it shows queer sex. It shows differently abled bodies. It shows different different races. Like, it's very inclusive in what it is. And ethical porn also tends to pay their workers and their, like, film crew fairly. They get a fair wage for their work. So that's a, ba- that's a big one. And ethical porn also really respects the boundaries and preferences and curiosity of the people that work at that company so whenever they're entering a scene and they're about to film they're not just meeting up and it's a quick 30 minute here's what you're going to do and we're going to film it they really take their time to explain what the scene is where is everyone's comfort level what are we going to do if someone does become uncomfortable like they're really kind of setting up the scene which is in my mind very parallel to in real life setting up like a BDSM scene, right? For yourself. There's a lot of work that goes into it ahead of time. That way it can run smoothly and everyone is consenting and everyone is safe. Yes. And they're also getting paid fairly for it. And it there's just there's enthusiastic consent throughout the whole thing. So that's how that's how I define ethical porn. It's so funny because your definition of ethical porn really parallels the sex positive movement definition, which I really enjoy. Oh yeah, I, I don't think I don't think I thought about that. Love it. Yeah. Like as you were saying it, I was mm-hmm. like, oh, sex positive, sex positive. Sex positive. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, my when I was doing my research, it was basically bringing up the same thing. Although I will say, my um, my research sources are always Google, YouTube, Wikipedia, right? Mm-hmm. I typed in ethical porn, and unfortunately, you don't have that in Wikipedia at all. Like, it's, Mm -hmm. you couldn't, I couldn't find anything as far as that goes. What I did find, which I thought was really interesting, was that um, ethical porn is synonymous with feminist porn. Yeah. Like, they're basically, Mm -hmm. those terms were interchangeable from what I've seen. So, yeah, feminist pornography is porn that is produced in a fair manner. Um, Yeah, they're paid with reasonable salary. Everything's treated with care. Um, everyone's consenting, it's safe, um, everybody's well-being is vital, and then the production appreciates all of its actor- all of its actors and workers, which, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just echoing what you said, which is the definition that I was coming up with as well. Yeah, absolutely. And some components of ethical porn, and if you're, if you who are listening are wondering, like, where do I find that kind of porn, that, we'll have a, a page on our website with source material, and we'll have some suggested websites to go to. And if you ever are looking for ethical porn, a lot of the sites are probably not going to be free, which makes sense. Like, yeah. pay for the porn that you're watching, because I, I mean, they're. It's a job like anything else. True, it's just they, so hard to do. I know, it's so hard to do because it's out there and it's free. And I'm not going to, it's not like I've oh. never watched free porn. I definitely watched free porn before. Yeah, me too. But, you know, the best quality okay. and and knowing it's not exploiting anyone, you're probably going to pay for it. But you're not even going to pay that much. Like one of the sites that I recommend is XO Afterglow. I think it's like 10 or $12 a month. So okay, it's bad. not like, I think when people hear they have to pay, I think... I think of like back in the day, like let's say in the 90s or, you know, the 2000s, like like when internet just got really big, people would pay so much money for porn oh, yeah. online. I don't think it's quite like that anymore. I don't think it's this outrageous cost. I think it's pretty reasonable for but what I you get. I think the, the hesitance of people paying for porn, mm-hmm. which I, because again, I agree with you, ethical porn is porn you pay for. I'm, I'm, I've, I've seen that all over the internet. Yeah. However, the hesitation that I have, and I know a lot of other people have, is that there's so much shame yes. around watching yes. porn yep. that 
the the whole even the act of paying for porn can feel shameful totally yeah. and you also get scared someone's gonna find out exactly. what, if, what if someone sees your bank statement and then they get they're frustrated. <laughs> yeah. what is this like, like exactly. I, I get it and that's part of that cycle that yeah. we just we just stay stuck you know the more shame we have we're not gonna want to do anything that's gonna risk exposing us and so we're not gonna pay for it and then i mean it's just <laughs> it's like a fucked up loop oh, yeah. you know yeah for sure so so that's you know one thing and it's and it's also made in safe environments for the workers it shows real sexual pleasure. It's created for all kinds of viewers. That's I a big that. sticking point. All kinds of viewers can find content that they like if, if with a really good ethical production company. And it's, it shows diversity across body size, race, sexuality, age, ability, right? You're going to get all different kinds of people who are involved. Because, again, going back to traditional porn, it's usually – young thin people yep. or guys who are like super in shape and yep. that's not realistic for everybody either or anatomy sizes can be exaggerated hey, oh yes Very yes much, yeah. like like the 10 inch dick it's oh like who's walking around with that <laughs> please love like it, that's ridiculous it. so yeah it's you're gonna see all kinds of different different body types one thing i did love about uh doing this research and looking at ethical porn feminist pornography however you go um is that what i loved about it is it really if 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 we're able to do it successfully mm -hmm. it empowers women in the industry yes which i absolutely love like um i i uh, looked at a quote from tristan Terromino, feminist filmmaker. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, they stated that the pornography created by women for women can give women control over what is being presented about female sexuality and how it is represented and di distributed and that feminist pornography allows women to have a voice in a male-dominated industry. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely love that statement. I was like, that's exactly what I wish we would get to. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I say it's inherently feminist. It is, right? Okay. And that's not anti-male. <laughs> Men are still involved in ethical porn, too. But it does give women a voice. And that actually kind of brings me to an another point that I have or something that I saw when I was doing research is like issues with ethical porn and not so much if ethical porn is done correctly. I don't see a lot of issues with it. But the term it's kind of like if you go to the grocery store and you buy organic foods and it just has the sticker on there, organic. Mm. You don't really know. <laughs> is, it, is it organic? Is it not? It could just be a sticker thrown on there. I feel like the same is with ethical porn. Like a company could say we're ethical but have nothing to back that up, yeah. right? And so that is kind of unfortunate because – without the proper information, without them laying it out on all the things that they're doing right to respect the workers who work for them. You don't really know if it's ethical or not. It's just, it's almost like a buzzword. It's easy to say if you're not doing, if you're not really looking into it. And speaking of like empowerment versus exploitation, mm -hmm. the article I ran across talked about OnlyFans and it was kind of questioning OnlyFans, like especially for women, is it empowering or is it, or is it exploitive okay. for women? Which I thought was really interesting because I always, I'm going to preface this with, I have no issue with OnlyFans and the people who are on there, like good for you, right? If yeah. it's a source of income for you, I have no issue with that. But the article I found was really going over, um, because you have such direct co direct contact with the people who are watching your material, yep. it's easy to be harassed. It's easy to have your boundaries pushed. And a lot of people, in order to make more money, they will push their own boundaries. You know, maybe someone is on there and they're not naked in their content. They're in a bra and panties and that's what they post. But they have a bunch of people on there commenting, wanting to see more, wanting to take off more clothes. If it's going to make you more money or it's promised that it will make you more money, you might be pushing your own boundaries, right? You might start taking up clothes that you don't want to. I'm, I'm using that as an example. But it just kind of talks about, like, how OnlyFans could be problematic and move from empowering if you're on there on your own and yeah. you get to choose how you show up and what kind of porn you're doing oh. into – are there empty promises? Are there people on there that have direct contact with you that are starting to now make it 
not ethical anymore. Oh, not girl, respectful anymore. I have a whole two slides on OnlyFans <laughs> and the commodification and monetization of the industry that I really, really do want to get into. Um, yeah, I will. I do want to bring it back to the. Um, the exploitative aspect Mm -hmm. because there are feminists that are very much anti-form feminists Mm -hmm. and i have this written down that basically in their perception the even saying the words feminist pornography is a contradiction to them almost an oxymoron Mm -hmm. because whatever was feminist is an oxymoron and that whatever was feminist but appeared to be pornographic should be instead labeled as erotica so did you see in your research a different, like, anything about erotica versus porn? No. Yeah, I see, didn't. that was very interesting to me because, and this seemed to be more of, like, the 80s, 90s, 2000s type of uh, mm-hmm. viewpoint with the uh, anti-form, anti-porn feminists. The anti-porn feminists were not, from what I've seen, not completely... Uh, um, against female desire, but they formed it as erotica to where that's the way that's the way to get it away from the word porn, but still be able to cater towards women, yeah. which I found fascinating. Interesting. I didn't see a lot about that. When I hear erotica, I think of books. Me too. Yeah, I think of bu- I think too. of um, you know, smut yes. is not what I would say. That's what a lot of people say, but it takes away the visual. So there's no porn performance, there's no performers, but it's a book that you read is what I think of when I think of erotica. Agreed. And Agreed. I think I think bo- erotica, by the way. I no, I've never really read erotica. And I should. I mean it's interesting. It's like I recommend my clients read it. My clients have found oh, erotica. Good. My clients have found erotica <laughs> that they really like. And I'll always make a note to myself, I should read that. This book that I'm recommending, I should read that. And I haven't oh, done girl, it yet. Zane got me through my call center <laughs> telemarketing <laughs> days. You have no idea. I was on a script and I'd be like, Yes, can you buy my product? And I'm sitting there reading the erotica <laughs> books as you know, just reading my script. It was great. But yeah, yeah. So I thought that was a fun little tidbit. But I did want to get back into the industry of porn. Uh, I loved what you said that basically uh, we're we're as much as OnlyFans is very empowering and it gives access to like small creators mm-hmm. and uh, things like that. And what I what I love about the industry is the OnlyFans basically opens up the floodgates for anyone who just kind of wants to join the sex work community. Uh, and this includes soccer moms, college kids, mm-hmm. you know, just everyone who under the sun. Uh, but inherently, if you're doing anything as far as a business, you're going to try to listen to your audience, right? Yeah. Um, you're going to try to get their feedback. And unfortunately, it can push you to some boundaries. But what I wanted to talk about with Ole and Fans is the other, the viewers, from the viewer's standpoint. Mm, okay. Because right? with Only Fans, the one thing, or the internet in general, the one thing that it has given us is not just actors being able to access it and produce their own um, fantasies on the internet, but it's also from the viewer standpoint made it so much more accessible to see these um, actors or just to be able to interact because beforehand, way back when, when we were getting porn, you know, our parents were getting porn, our our grandparents were getting porn. They were using magazines, right? Yes. For the most part. Or you had to go to this skeezy little um, adult. Theater. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Some, something. Or if you did the the VHSs, you had to go into the back room of some type of, you know, really shop or dimly lit, whatever. So it just, you had that one film that you just watched over and over and that was kind of it. You had that one magazine that you just kind of flipped through over and over and that was it, right? Yeah. Um, whereas now... You can basically subscribe to your favorite creator. You can er- interact with this creator. You can comment. You can send them gifts. It's you can so, go to much so much which engagement, which is kind of scary because one thing I, when I was looking up the OnlyFans stuff, it's easy to have a stalker. Oh, yeah. So easy because they feel like they have this immediate access to you. And in a way, they kind of do. Yeah, with the internet and create content creators. And again, we're, we're here yeah. as content creators right now. Um, there's a whole thing of parasocial relationships, mm-hmm. right? And that was a term that I just recently oh, yep. learned, mm-hmm. right? Where you just, you feel like you know this person just because you've consumed a lot of their content, right? Yeah. So a parasocial relationship with your favorite sex worker is, I don't, 
I don't want to say the word's not problematic. I shouldn't say the word problematic, but it's it's such a nuanced subject that I don't know how that affects your real relationships, right? Yeah. Um, so that I was seeing a lot of rebuttal when it came to um, OnlyFans and just the unpredicted side effects of being able to make the internet more inclusive, make it more accessible, make these people more accessible. Um, is yeah, it's causing a lot of people to have these big attachments and it can confuse, it can bring confusion with your real life relationship. Totally. And it's kind of like if you watch porn and you think that's how it really looks, it's very like parallel to that in a way where it's like, no, I have this person that I really have this relationship with. I really know them and you don't know them at at all. It's the same as if porn is your education. Like, well, that's what it looks like. That's not what it looks like at all. And this parasocial relationship you have with your favorite sex worker is not a real relationship they're there to do a job and you're paying them for a job it's transactional and that's not what sex is supposed to look like in your real life relationships and you know because it's so easily accessible and again i think this goes to harming people and especially women if and, and i know you've probably heard the stories but there's been stories where you know, a local woman gets found out on OnlyFans and they like lose their job and they're not on the school board anymore and they don't want their kids to go to that school anymore. Like the community will really turn against you if they find out that you're, you know, a creator on OnlyFans. And it's because it's so easily accessible. You're putting yourself at risk. It's unfortunate. I don't think that's how it should be, but that's the reality of kind of what OnlyFans has come to be. So... Back to that parasocial relationship, um, I wanted to ask you as a relationship therapist, because mm-hmm. I'm sure that this is this is a very common thing that I've seen with couples, mm-hmm. and I don't know if it's been brought up in your practice, but I assume it has. Um, do you come across people who feel like their partner watching porn is cheating? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they do. They do. They'll feel that way. And that's actually a really interesting question because it's couple dependent. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like what really is cheating? Is it any porn or is it engagement with cam girls? Right. I'll tell you my personal like definition. I think the engagement piece is what would feel like cheating to me. Like if my partner was was interacting with cam girls and like having conversations with them and paying them directly. And I if there's like even the beginning of a relationship with someone no matter how small that's when it would make me feel uneasy if that makes any sense okay. but watching porn videos where you don't have the engagement i have no issue with that's just that's just my personal definition not everyone's gonna okay agree with that which i think is fine so right? i'm curious now because i'm hearing a little bit of contradiction which i'm mm. loving i'm loving this contradiction because we're basically preaching to our audience that you should be paying for porn. Mm-hmm. Those are the ethical way to get it. You should be, you know, supporting these creators and things like that. Yeah. So for these partners who are supporting creator, are engaging in ethical porn practices, mm-hmm. and are, you know, basically financially supporting yeah. these people, and the fact that they're getting a parasocial connection to mm-hmm. these creators... Do you feel like that could be problematic in the infidelity department? Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Yeah. Because they're trying to be ethical with their porn use, but it might Well, it's, but you, I feel like you can be ethical in your porn use and not build a connection with the person you're paying, if that makes any sense. Like, if I'm paying for my porn, yeah, it's going to a person that's basically me saying I support you. But I guess what I'm really – and it's good that you're asking this question because you can really get in the weeds on this. Everyone feels so differently. What I'm about to say, someone out there might be like, I would have no issue with that, right? It all depends on you and what you're okay with. Where I see it being really being a problem, and I've seen this before with, like, infidelity – if I'm going to use cam girls as an example because I feel like it's that one-on-one mm-hmm. interaction, maybe even with like OnlyFans, right? Like the one-on-one interaction. If you're interacting with them and it's like, how do I pay you? And then I pay you like you're on your way, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think I think I could be okay with that. But if you're communicating with them in a way where it's like, tell me more about you. I'm going to tell you about myself. Oh, I really like when you do this. And the communication starts becoming constant. Mm. Mm-hmm. And you're going on there every day not just to watch them but to talk to them. 
that to me is that slippery slope into like, wait a second, are you building a connection with them? Because that's going to start to bother me, right? What a fuzzy line. It is a fuzzy fuzzy line. line. You can get in the weeds on like, how do you define what's okay and what's not? Mm -hmm. Because I'm not saying this is true for everybody, but people, going back to that parasocial relationship, it's easy for someone to think, they're in some kind of relationship with the cam girl that they're watching, and that's why they want to watch every single day. Oh, yeah, for sure. I have YouTube. Mm-hmm. I mean, again, I don't have any uh, sex work uh, creators that I follow yet. Might be coming. But I have YouTubers and I have podcasts that I literally follow all day, every day. Anytime they post something, like I, mm-hmm. I watch them. I really love their opinions. I really go to them, whether it's for entertainment or it's education. I go to them almost religiously yeah so i can i can see that also paralleling into sites like OnlyFans or into these ethical porn sites where they do find someone that they really actually even without the ethical porn sites i knew a um back when i was in a warehouse and i was around a lot of men we used to have a favorite porn star that they they shared all the time just between each other her name was pinky and Mm. everyone in the warehouse loved pinky um and yeah this is a creator that they followed and watched just about every video that she produced. Yeah. About, you know how to, um, so yeah, I wonder how oh, that's such a slippery slope when it comes it's to a, partner. Yeah. It's a slippery slope. And I think it depends on, is it having some kind of impact on your relationship? Like, oh, I, like I'll talk about my husband, if he was, you know, engaging in something every single day, and I notice we're not having sex that much, but he wants to make sure he's logged on every single day to watch this other woman's, mater- you know, material. I think that's another area where I would start to feel like, of course, wait a second, what's yeah. going on here? And so yeah. it's really about what are you getting there that I'm not bringing, that, yeah. right? Or why would you prefer that and not me? Like yep. what's what's going on here? So if it ever starts to feel like your partner's taking something away from your relationship and putting that energy somewhere else. I think it's that connection piece that starts to feel like cheating and not so much they watch porn. I guess is the overall message of okay, this whole yeah. episode is it's True. not is it's not the porn that's problematic, it's your relationship to it. And if it starts to pull away from your in real life relationship, that's kind of dangerous territory that you want to you want to watch out for. No, I like it. I like mm-hmm. your input cuz mm-hmm. that was as doing the research I definitely st- felt a little bit of uncomfortableness in that yeah okay if I pay for how would my wife feel if I paid for porn I really like the creator because I you know I do get attached to creators pretty pretty easily and yeah yeah just a Mm -hmm. lot of nuance I love it I love it so I do want to go back to the industry Mm -hmm. aspect because I do want to pretty much bring it home that we tend to unfortunately reach out to porn for education anatomy seeing what we're supposed to be doing but one thing that i definitely just want to just just stick in people's mind is that porn is at the root it's entertainment right Mm -hmm. and entertainment is a business Mm -hmm. so everything um is tailored to basically um get as much so business okay Let me just read this. Our brains are wired for sex to ensure our species survival and companies exploit that wiring, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Similar to how, you know, there's a lot of companies that produce a lot of sugary snacks because we're biologically supposed to be liking high caloric, very um, caloric dense type of foods. Those are actually the more delicious foods. Yeah. Um, I love me some some cookies. (laughs) But the food industry, they do tailor to things that are more delicious, right? Whether it's good for our diet, whether that might lead to diabetes later down the line. We have a big fast food industry. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what the porn industry has done as well. Like they've tailored it to your entertainment, what you're going to watch, um, what gets the most clicks, even what's the most shock value. Yeah. I mean, that's what they're going to produce because obviously as a business, they want to make more money. It's yeah. all about profits. Mm-hmm. Um, so we do have predatory practices that cater around just getting views and um, optimizing the SEO, the search engines, yeah. right? Uh, and then on top of that, we're always just in society, we're exposed to a lot of sexually charged stimuli, right? Even without the porn industry, You've seen a sex scene in a movie. You've seen, you know, um, a lot of the commercials they'll tailor towards, you know, Axe body spray. You know, the, um, yeah. Right? Um, and unfortunately, yeah, that does distort your expectations, your real expectations versus or it distorts 
your expectations versus what's actually real and what's mm-hmm. actually going on and exactly how that woman is going to get pleasure. Yeah. Um, and so you see these sites where they're uh, people as a queer lady, people do go onto those sites to try to see how do I pleasure a woman? And those aren't exactly the uh, scenes that you should be learning from. Yeah. And yeah, I'm trying to drive that point home. I yeah, I yeah. totally get your point. It's okay. all about the it's all about the money. Yes, it's all about, all the, money. about the money. It's not about is it realistic. It's all about the money. Yeah, and I bet you these ethical porn companies are not making the profit that porn hub is. Oh, and I, and I mean that like as a compliment, honestly, because yes. like they deserve to make money too. That's their work, but they're not in it just to make profit, no matter what. Right? They're not going to have harmful practices if it's going to make them an extra dollar. You know, so. Mm-hmm. I think of like hardcore porn, like that term, you've probably heard hardcore. Every year it has to get more and more hardcore, more. It's like you got to keep up with it because, you know, 20, 30 years ago, hardcore porn might have been like rough intercourse. Okay. But now it's like more and more risky, more and more risky, more and more risky. And I have, and there's nothing wrong with, I'll just use like sadomasochism as an example. If you're into that, there's a way to do it safely and consensually. Yes. Like, I, I have no issue with that, but it's the depiction of it, right? It's like the more risk we show, the more money we'll make. And there's a lot of, they're not worrying about the safety of it all. So someone watches it and they don't know any better. They're going to think, well, that's just what X, Y, and Z sex acts looked like. And that's what I'm going to go out and do. And it's like, well, wait a second. There's a whole educational piece behind it that you're missing. You could go out there and really harm someone. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's, it's very scary. Yes. Um, when it's about the profit, it's scary to me. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, guys, watch ethical porn. It's important. Um, I know it feels really weird <laughs> to actually pay for porn because, again, there's a lot of morality and porn is a very complex subject. Um, I'm, I'm learning. Yes, very complex, very nuanced. Yes. And I want to – I uh, have a few extra things I want to say about kind of like – history of the porn industry and how did porn even start and how did we end up where we are here now and so yeah i kind of want to add add a couple things i'm going to mention a couple of um or actually there's the hbo documentary that i'm going to mention hbo show and documentary but really porn yeah really porn started of course with hugh hefner okay 1953 no fucking way yeah 1953 was the first copy of playboy and that's when we, that's what we coin as like the start of porn. I, I believe so, yeah. And I'm not saying there's never been porn or sex workers before. They've been there, you know, yeah. forever and ever. About the time. But yeah, in my, from what I know, I believe it was in the 50s when Playboy came out. Go Mr. Hugh Hefner. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, and he was problematic in his own way. I mean, he, you know, from what I know, he wasn't like the most respectful guy. Oh, really? No, he. I okay. think he. I think he had his own problems too. But that's when it started. And so it was magazines. So porn was images. Yes. And then the eighties come, and people have VCRs, and so we have tapes of porn. And the one that always blows my mind is Tommy Lee and Pamela Anderson. Their yes. leaked sex tape. By the way, their sex tape really was stolen. It was not leaked by them. It really was stolen legitimately. Like, they had it on a VHS in the safe in their house, and they were on vacation, and someone somehow got the code of their house or broke in and stole everything out of the safe. And then, of course, part of the, what was in the safe was that tape, and they were like, oh, my God, like, Tommy Lee and Pamela Anderson. And they started selling They started making copies. They started selling it. People were paying out the ass for this tape, and they were waiting like six weeks, eight weeks for it to be mailed to their house. Uh, for you people who are just listening, my jaw's on the floor. Yeah, like, it, it was like le- it was legitimately stolen, and I and I feel awful for both of them because if you go back and look at their interviews for the next years after this happened that's all people want to talk about oh, yeah, you, can, yeah, know about you see them. clips of pamela anderson like she's like so sick of this shit you know like if you're gonna interview me like can we talk about something else and everyone oh. thought it was like this fun thing to talk about and it was not a fun thing to talk about for them because it was a private moment between them of course on their honeymoon it was supposed to be for them and it wasn't so i understand that so that was like I just, that was wild to me that people paid, like the guy who stole that tape made a ton of money off that tape. Of course. So much money. It like wild to me. And then in the 90s with the internet, all it takes is a few clicks and you get your porn at home. Of course. And so that's kind of the very like 
you know, skimmed over kind of evolution of how we end up with porn and where we are now because it's just so easily accessible. More people are watching it, and I think it evolved people, really quickly. yeah, evolved so quickly. And people think like, oh, it's just such a huge problem. It's not necessarily that more porn is the problem. It's just still relatively new. If you think yeah. the '90s to now, that's like what thirty years. Wow, actually, yeah, wow. It's not that long of a time for it to be so easily accessible. So it feels so problematic, but I feel like it doesn't have to be. But the documentary I wanted I wanted to bring up. There's a show called The Deuce on HBO, okay. and there's a Netflix documentary. I believe it's called The Times Square Killer. And in the '70s and '80s in New York porn and peep shows and live sex shows and all of that were huge on Times Square. Interesting. In New York in the 70s and 80s, clusterfuck, disgusting. Like, it took a long time to clean up the city from those times. Because, like, in the documentary, there is a woman, her name is Ramola Hodas, and her dad was Marty Hodas, and he was known as, like, the king of porn in New York. Okay. And he owned so many of the buildings, and they would have live sex shows and peep shows and all of the above. And she talks about, like, her dad being the king of porn. Her and her siblings at a really young age were exposed to lots of drugs, lots of money, lots of swingers parties, like, at their house. Like, as kids. So there's, wow. there's people having sex in their house wow. as kids, and they're walking down the street, and there's there's people who are naked. There's people having sex in, like, the, the places that they're walking into. And it was just – it was a hot-ass mess. And it's called Times Square Killer because it's about a serial killer who was killing sex workers. <laughs> and it's called – I'm going back to, like, the documentary name but being called The Deuce. It's called The Deuce because – this was all on 42nd Street in New York, in Times yeah. Square. And so 42nd, they would call it like 40 Deuce, like two was Deuce, which you have to be like such a douchebag to call it 40 Deuce, right? <laughs> like, like, like if I heard someone say, yeah, we're going to 40 Deuce Street, I'd be like, okay, shut up, right? But that's why it's called the Deuce. And I'm mentioning this because at that time, you know, these live performances were just such a hot attraction but it also led to a lot of harassment, a lot of abuse. And one of the guys in the documentary, he was part of like the live sex shows. And he would have to do like five or six shows a night. Wow. You're having sex five or six times in the How? span of a few hours. And you would you would have to keep up with that. Wow. Yeah. And so there's talk about exploitation too i yeah. highly doubt these people were getting paid well the no. king of porn was making a lot of money but like destroying the city and in the process of it hmm. and then and the whole point of it was like the serial killer that was killing sex workers and the sad thing is you know sex workers and they refer to them as prostitutes because it was the 70s course, and yeah. that's what they called them then but they were just really kind of looked at as like the lowest of low oh, citizens. Always. No it's one gives a shit about yeah. them. Like they're disgusting, but men are not disgusting for going to them and paying them for no, sex. If, as a serial killer, as a true crime buff who yeah. listens to true crime pretty frequently, I've noticed that if you want to be a serial killer and you want to not get caught, you victimize people who are forgotten about, which is sex workers and the homeless, which yes. is insane. Yeah. So their cases are not taken seriously. Yeah. And sex workers also can't go to the police. You know, yep. they're they're being harassed, they're being they're being raped, they're being it's just all kind of horrible things happen to them, but yep. if they go to the police, they're going to get in trouble because their job is illegal. Yeah, which is disgusting. You can't and so it's just really really it was really really sad and the documentary is really good, really informational, but it kind of shines a light on what New York was like in Good. the 70s and 80s and i just have to plug this in here rudy giuliani gets a lot of credit for cleaning up new york like when he became mayor i think mm. like in the 90s like he gets a lot of credit for it but um not a fan of rudy giuliani <laughs> I know, we're getting <laughs> he, political. yeah but he <laughs> i just have to point out like he does not deserve the credit for cleaning it up. Okay. It was actually the mayor before him, Edward Koch, I think is how you pronounce his last name, but the mayor okay. before him, like 14 years before Rudy Giuliani got into office, the cleanup work was already starting, but it just took that long to come to fruition. So, of course, of course. Rudy Giuliani shows up and it's like, oh, I'm cleaning up the city. And it's like, okay, well, it took years of, of work. This process is already in place. Yeah, yeah, and so a lot of those buildings, a lot of those buildings and theaters now are like, 
restaurants and tourist attractions and that's how they were really able to clean it up so I just thought that was so interesting that New York was like a big part of history no I love that you mentioned Times Square because I have this slide on here it's basically little fun facts that I found during the research that uh um that I just kind of put to the side and one of the fun facts was basically for the anti-porn feminists Mm -hmm. they um they actually made a campaign and it was called women against pornography and they created a an event called (laughs) take back the night Mm -hmm. right where they marched and this is a quote from Wikipedia which I found really comical um it include marches uh, around locations such as Times Square which contained adult bookstores, massage parlors with parentheses, a euphemism for a brothel, which I thought was hilarious, uh. and strip clubs, which I thought was crazy. I love that little fact, and I was like, wow. Well, and I'm laughing because it's women against pornography, so it's WAP, <laughs> which is oh. not, <laughs> not what I think of when I think of WAP. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I just, yeah, there's, there's a ton, you know, and I actually, speaking of like the anti-porn feminist, it goes back to our first episode when we yes. talked about the feminist wars and like the two, part. it's just so funny. And the feminist sex wars. Feminist sex wars. Yes. That's what it's called. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I love, I love that title. Okay. <laughs> One thing I did want to bring up, two of the other facts that I found that I found really interesting is that separately in reaction to the 1983 Dworkin McKinnon Ordinance, lesbian feminists founded the Sex Positive and Sex Magazine on our backs, mm. which I didn't even know existed. So for if you are a queer lady out there, apparently we do have a um, sex positive lesbian magazine that was created. Obviously it's older, but I thought that was awesome. That's awesome. Yes. That's so cool. I didn't know that either. And then one sad fact that I found, um, which I, again, ethical porn does look to change, is that unfortunately people of color black performers often received only half to three quarters of what white performers are paid mm. which is a discrepancy that i thought was i mean that's huge that's significant half is engine is insane it is interesting that you mentioned that okay. because one of the um like porn sites that you can go to on our website I try to include like black owned production companies because they have like an extra barrier to fight, right? Love it. And Jet Setting Jasmine and King Noir, like they're, <sighs> they have, yeah, they have a Royal Fetish Films, which we're going to include. And they've got, there's an article out there that I could include too about like how they're fighting that barrier that black performers face in the industry. Um, and I have a couple of other, like there's a filmmaker in here who's black, who's like really well known mm. in the industry. And, and they, and unfortunately they have to fight to be paid the same as, as like their white, you know, co-stars, yes, unfortunately. which is like complete bullshit. Mm. And so good for them for going out there and, making their own, like, fuck it, we'll do our own, we'll do it our own way, you no, know? No, you were the one who brought them to my attention, and A, they're hot as hell, and B, guys, yeah, I, if, if you want to go to the ethical porn route, I highly, highly recommend looking at Jet Setting Jasmine and King Noir. King Noir. Mm-hmm. King Noir, they're am- amazing from what I've seen, yeah. Yes, yes, yep, so I just had to share that, we will have all that on our website, so. Okay, good. So we do need to address one thing, which is the fact that We promised you guys a guest on this episode, and we do intend on uh, fulfilling that promise. We did want to come out with this episode first as like a bonus episode almost of just kind of what we think ethical porn is before we actually talk to someone in the Mm -hmm. profession, in the industry. Um, So, yeah. 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 So next week we will have... uh, a very special guest, Tressa Sil- Silguero. I mm-hmm. apologize if I s- pronounced that wrong, Tressa. But she is, she's also known as Stella May. Mm-hmm. And she is the star of Hot Girls Wanted on Netflix. Yes. So, or one of the stars. So, yeah, I'm really excited for that. Yeah, I can't wait to have her on. That's going to be our episode after this one. And we'll get to ask her just her personal insight of what it was like to be what it's like to be in the industry, yes. what her experience was. So I-, I cannot wait to have her on. I can't wait. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's all for today. I'm, I'm glad we got to talk about this. And again, we are Sex Positivity Unfiltered. And uh, remember to stay curious and fuck politeness. Mm-hmm.